Brad, you've told us to do stuff that sometimes we might accidentally just sort of stumble on getting right, but it would never be the way that you intend or have the effect that you intend unless you empower us to, to do so. So I pray that you, would, um, that you would speak loudly to us through your word today and that you would do that thing that you do for each of us where you move us into a place of agreement with you and compliance with, with what it is that you have said because that really is the pathway of blessing. So teach us how to follow Christ today and be more like him. Pray this in Jesus' name and under his blood. Amen. All right, guys, uh, let's take a quick survey here. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And here's how you vote, all right? Thumbs up if you would consider the scenario that I lay out to be respectable. All right, I'll, I'll say, yeah, this guy did that. You say, yeah, that's respectable, or boo, that's evil. Okay, respectable, evil. Ready? Here we go. You have more food than you need, and so you take the extra food that you have and you give it to somebody who doesn't have enough. Respectable or evil? All right, hold them up, hold them up. Pretty unanimous? Good, okay. <laughs> you passed. Um, let's, let's change it a little bit. You have exactly enough food for you and your family, okay, no extra, and then there's somebody in desperate need. So you take your own portion and give most of it to the person in need. You take less yourself. Respectable or evil? Okay. <laughs> All right. We got a ballot held in the air. Nice. All right. Let's, let's run one more scenario. You don't quite have enough food for your whole family to have a full meal, okay? And then somebody knocks on your door and they are in desperate need. So even not having enough, you still invite them in and share what you have. Respectable or evil? Okay, hold on. Okay, see, on, on that one, sometimes you would get some debate because it's like, no, if the kids don't have enough, then the, the other guy can go take a walk because, you know, whatever. There's a debate to be had, but everybody in here just said, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good, that's a virtuous thing to do. Here's what I want you to know. That answer, all of those answers, those are culturally conditioned. That's not human nature, what you just said. The reason that we think this way in this room is because we have been raised with a certain set of values that communicated that to us. There's a lot of cultures out there where generosity is actually seen as evil because whatever you give away is something you could have kept for your family or for future generations. And so charity is seen as hatred towards your children, your grand grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and so on. In our culture, that idea didn't take root. Here's the question. Why not? Why do so many people think the same way? And the reason is because our culture in this area has been shaped by Luke 10. Okay? Jesus spoke the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we formed around that our idea of charity, of helping the poor. If you see a wheelchair ramp going into a building, that's because Luke 10 was spoken by Jesus. Okay? That's not universal. And so his words here are so powerful to shape our lives, and they can, they can shape an entire hemisphere. They can, they can influence and form a culture as a whole, and we are living proof of that by the votes we just took. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through here and see not just what he said, but why he said it, and then how we're going to go about moving further in that direction for the blessing of those around us. Okay? Luke 10, we're going to set some context. I'll start you in verse 25. So Jesus is basically, um, uh, he's, he's talking to a whole bunch of people. There's crowds around him. His popularity is kind of at peak. It'll start diving off after this. But right now, a lot of people listening to Jesus, right? And so there's this, this lawyer, and the lawyer is not, like, their, their idea of a lawyer was not the same as ours, right? We think of a lawyer, we think of somebody that stands in front of a judge, you know, a, a civil arguer, that kind of thing. The lawyers for these guys, they were the masters of the Jewish law. Okay, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those are the law of Moses. And the lawyers, also called the scribes, they are the guys that guard the law, that say to the priests and to the, the local politicians and all of this, yes, that is legal, no, that is illegal according to God's law. So they're, they're like basically just Hebrew professors that spend all day reading scrolls and voting like you guys just did, right? So that's what the, that's what the lawyer was doing. He was a scribe. Very, very educated. And these guys are the guys that know the law. So in verse 25, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. Which, by the way, if you've never read the Bible, uh, don't do that. All right? When you put Jesus to the test, you lose. And you kind of end up looking stupid. If you don't believe me, sit tight. <laughs> put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, no, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he, Jesus, said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. All right, let's stop there for a minute. This is a strange answer to those of us that have grabbed on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, if you're not familiar with this, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, the gospel is the, the good news. It actually starts with bad news. And what it says is we are separated from God by sin, but we're reunited to God through who Jesus is and through what he has done. Right? So our sin, all the, the anti-God stuff that we do, has this effect of breaking the relationship between us and God. Which makes sense. When you do something that's a direct offense to somebody else, you're not on good terms with the person, right? There's, there's beef. And so we're separated from God because of our sin, our anti-God behavior. And then we are reunited to God, how? By doing better? By undoing what we've done in the past? No, the Bible says, look, that ain't going to work. You know, it's, it's just a hopeless endeavor. So the only way to be reunited to God and to have eternal life, because he's the source of all life, is to grab onto Jesus who promises to bring us back to God. Right? So that's, that's the gospel, is that there's nothing that we can do to impress God enough to bring us into heaven. Jesus did it all. Right? So now why is Jesus here saying, oh, you want eternal life? You just keep the law. Does that seem weird to anybody? <laughs> like, Jesus, did you just contradict your own gospel? And here's the deal, because he says exactly the opposite in a lot of places, right? I'll just run you through a couple of these. We don't need to flip all over the place. John 6, 29, somebody says, what must we do that we can do the works of God? And Jesus says, these are the works of God that you believe in the only one God, the one true living God is Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So how do, you, how do you do something that pleases God? You don't do anything. You just trust. You believe. Okay? Acts 16, verse 30, the Philippian jailer says to the apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? And his answer is, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay? You don't do something to, get to, to go to heaven. You believe in Christ and he brings you there. You trust him to do it and he does it. Right? Um, well, actually, I, I will read you a couple. How about Galatians uh, 2, probably? Verse I'm looking for. Yeah, Galatians 2.16. Listen to this. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified, he's not made right with God, by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. Even when we have believed in Christ Jesus, I'm sorry, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Let's read you one more verse. Chapter 5, verse 4. Galatians 5, 4. The Apostle Paul here is yelling at people who are trying to work their way to heaven, right? He says, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Oof. So the Bible's pretty clear, right? How, what must you do to inherit eternal life? You just look at Christ and say, I can't do anything. You did it all. I trust you. And then he wraps us up, and we get adopted into the family of God, and we get the inheritance of Christ, which is eternal life. It's all this great stuff, not by works, but by faith. You trust him. So then why does Jesus in Luke 10 say, oh, you want eternal life? Keep the law. What a weird thing to say. Was he contradicting his own gospel? No, here's what he was doing. He was setting an impossible standard for this lawyer so that the lawyer would see that he can't meet that standard. See, one of the reasons that God gave us a law is because a law shows you the heart of a lawgiver, right? It shows you the values of the society that makes the law or of the king that makes the law or whatever. I mean, I mentioned wheelchair ramps, right? The reason that that's part of, the, that handicap access is part of our building codes is because we have, as a society have decided we value the participation of handicapped people in whatever is going on in this building. So we will require that they get access. The law shows you the heart of the lawgiver, right? It's the same thing with the law of God. So when he throws a law out there, he's saying, here's what I say is good and bad and lovely and putrid and, you know, whatever. And then we, in trying to, you know, keep that law, we see all of these points at which we depart from the law. And we're just like, but I can't do that, right? I mean, part of it says, be, be holy as your father is holy, or be holy for I am holy. Jesus says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. How y'all doing with that one, Right? So God gives us a law, and one of the functions of that, yes, it's the pathway of blessing and all this, but one of the things is it's just a mirror, and it's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm not really like that in a lot of ways. Think about it this way. When you were a kid, 
you went to, um, you know, you went to the, the ball pit at McDonald's, which I have not seen lately, a ball pit in McDonald's. I'm ready to protest. We're taking up signs this afternoon. Uh, although they, they do have some of those in Burger King still, but Burger King is going bankrupt. So get your Whoppers now because I think they're going away. I know, right? We're going to hold a solemn assembly and just be like <laughs> collectively weep. So the, you go to the ball pit and it says, you know, must be this tall to enter the ball pit, right? Imagine going to the pearly gates of heaven, which I know it's not a thing. It's not in the Bible, but let's just go with the image, right? You go to the pearly gates and it says, must be this godly to enter. Right? <laughs> like, what do you do? I can't grow. What, what do you do? And that's what the law does, right? Must be this godly to enter. What's the standard for heaven? Zero sin, absolute perfection, all the time, no exceptions. And so the lawyer says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he's like, you know the law, right? He's like, yeah, I'm a lawyer. He's like, do that. You got to be fine. <laughs> he's baiting him is what's going on because Jesus is hilarious. And so what he was doing was he was laying a trap because what, what we see next is that the lawyer fell for it. And he goes, yeah, all right, so love God with everything you got. Love your neighbor all the time. But then he says in verse 29, but who's my neighbor? Right? Really, who, is, who am I supposed to love like that? You see what he's doing there? He's acknowledging that he can't keep the law as it's written. So he's got to redefine some stuff, and he's got to soften some stuff, and he's got to take that checkbox down to his level so he can reach it, check it, and then say, yes, I am righteous. But as soon as he changes the law, it's not God's law anymore. Now it's just man's law. That's not going to get you anywhere. Right? We do the same thing in our culture, right? If, um, like he's coming at it from a religious perspective, but we all do the same thing. You know, I, I ask people a lot, you know, what do you think is going to happen, you know, half a second after you die? And I usually get the same answers from people who are not, you know, followers of Christ or not a member of any religion particularly. They'll say, well, look, I think I'm going to be fine. If there's a heaven, I'm probably going to go there. If there's a hell, I'm probably not going to go there. And dude, the conversation almost always goes the same way. It's like, well, why do you think you're going to go to heaven and not hell if, if these things exist? And they say what? Because I'm a good person, right? All right, well, based on what? And then I usually hear this, and do not ever say this in my presence. Well, I'm not Hitler. Okay. That's the standard? Like, that's, that's okay. Like, by the way, I'm so sick of this. Everything's, every, everybody's Hitler these days. Everybody's a Nazi. My rule is that if you mention Hitler in an argument that's not about Hitler, you automatically lose. All right? We need a new standard for morality than that guy. Can we all agree on that? I had, a, I had a guy recently tell me, like, well, it's not like I choke puppies for fun. I'm like, there you go. That would be evil, right? Now we got something to put some handles on. Let's not do that. That'll be a baseline for morality. So, boy, that got weird, didn't it? Uh, so what we do is we measure ourselves by ourselves. We create some standard, and we define the words however we need to in order to come out feeling pretty good about ourselves. And Jesus just has no patience for this. What the lawyer is doing is trying to soften the commands of God. He's trying to shrink his realm of responsibility. And Jesus absolutely refuses to let him shrink his realm of responsibility. Let's look at his answer. Back to Luke 10. <clears throat> and by the way, we're going to look more at this lawyer uh, next week because there's some stuff going on in his heart and in his mind that's going on with all of us. And Jesus addresses it so skillfully that I'm just going to take a whole, a whole separate week on it. Jesus essentially just dissects the human heart and says, that's what's going on, right? So we'll take a look at that. But today I want to focus mostly on the, the parable. So he says, all right, what must I do? How can I shrink my, my realm of responsibility? And Jesus replies with this, verse 30. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from, Jer uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and they beat him, and they went away leaving him half dead. All right. I don't want to bog you down with details here, but there's cultural context that the original hearers understood that we don't. So I've got to fill in some gaps. There was a road, a real road, that went from Jerusalem down to Jericho, okay? And it was about 17 miles long, and it was called the, the, road, the Highway of Adama, which is related to the Hebrew word for blood, right? So it was essentially the Highway of Blood. And the reason for that, it was because it was super dangerous. It was winding, and it was, I think I said this, 17 miles which you had to make it through, 
and it was a 34,000-foot um, 34, drop in elevation, if I remember correctly. And so it's just this massive, you know, treacherous thing. And then there's caves on both sides through most of it. So robbers would hide in there, and if you are not well secure or you have too much stuff and you're vulnerable or whatever, the robbers just come out and get you. So when Jesus said this, they're like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a day-to-day -day situation, right? Um, the, uh, uh, th there are stories written down from the time of Jesus about some horrific events. I mean, they would, they, they stop, they go beyond vandalism to human rights violations. And this was what was normal on the, the highway of blood. And so Jesus says, let me take you there for a second, because these guys have all walked that highway before, right? So from Jerusalem to Jericho, the inevitable happens. This guy gets jumped, he gets mugged, and he gets left half dead. Verse 31. By chance, a priest was going down on the road. And when he saw him, he ran up to him and gave him a hug and said, I am so sorry that somebody mistreated you and patted him on the head. Right? No. What did he do? When he saw him, he passed by on the other side of the road. All right? Likewise also, a Levite, when he was coming to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Here's what's going on. Priests would handle the religious stuff at the temple. The Levites were kind of the priest's assistants. They were the, the servants. So the priest would burn the incense and offer the prayers and do whatever. And the Levites were, I mean, you could kind of almost see them as like deacons in the church these days. They're leaders because they lead by example, not so much by talking, right? So the priest needs to be over here offering a sacrifice, but there's somebody over there that needs something. The Levite will go and handle that. So here's this guy, this Jewish guy, he's beat up, he's bloody, he's robbed, he's about to die, and he sees a holy man. He sees the priest walking down the road. Can you imagine his relief? Ah, there's God's guy. I'll be okay. God has seen my affliction and will deliver me. And then the priest picks up the tassels on the end of his robe so he doesn't get them dirty, and he walks by on the other side of the road. Can you imagine this guy's disappointment, the hopelessness? But it's okay, because then comes a Levite. Oh, good, we got a deacon in the church now, right? And they wore certain clothes. You could pick them out. And so he walks up and then goes over to the other side of the road and keeps walking. Now listen. The established, entrenched religion of this guy who got mugged had just failed him twice, okay? This is in the community of God's people. Erica, I'm seeing some people get uh, kind of uh, chilly in here. Would you mind just bumping it up a couple degrees? Thank you. There's, uh, there, this is the community of God's people in whom this guy had placed his hope, and they failed him two times. Okay? I know this is the story of a lot of people in here, right? Anybody ever met a pastor who's just a real jerk? Go easy on me, by the way. I'm standing right here. <laughs> no, I'm messing with you. But like the, like the pastor that just doesn't have time for anybody because he's too holy, right? Uh, excuse me, I don't have time for your garbage. I'm busy levitating over here. You know, like that guy. Look, here's what I want you to know. If that guy has hurt you before, he did that in defiance to the commands of Jesus, all right? I don't want you to see a knucklehead pastor, and we exist, you know? I don't want you to see a knucklehead pastor as um, representative of what Christ was actually saying. What was he saying? How does Christ command us to care for people? It's written down right there. We're not always the best examples of it, but I would just encourage you, listen to Jesus instead of to, to fallen men, okay? So... This guy has the experience that many people have had. He's let down by somebody that he should be able to count on. All right. So then what happens? What are we in, 31 here? 33. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came up to him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. I went through this a couple weeks ago, so I'm not going to do the whole thing again, but Samaritans did not like Jews, and Jews did not like Samaritans. Okay? There was racial tension, there was historical tension, there was political tension, there was geographical tension, there was economic tension. Right? There was every kind of tension you could imagine. And sometimes, when they got together, they would fight and kill each other. All right? They would burn each other's temples down and stuff. These guys, the Jews and the Samaritans, they would rearrange their journeys by three to five days just to avoid each other's territory. All right? they, they were enemies. They weren't just outsiders, they were enemies. And yet, here's a Samaritan that sees this hurting Jew and feels compassion on him. 34. What, I'm going to read this, and what you're going to see is seven different kindnesses that the Samaritan showed him, all right? He came to him, 
right? Rather than running away from him, he showed up. He bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, essentially treating the wounds. He put him on his own beast, on his own donkey, so the Samaritan probably had to walk, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, oh, wow, that's another one, so he stayed overnight with him. Anyway, on the next day, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever you spend, whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. So he ensured his ongoing care, all right? Now, two denarii is two days' wages. We see this in Matthew 20, verse 2. And from what we know of, I mean, we've got some records of how much the inns would charge back then. We figure that that's probably about 24 days' stay in this little hotel area. But when you think of an inn, I don't want you to be thinking of, you know, the, the, even a day's inn, right? Like, you go to the day's inn, you're like, wow, how many bugs can you count from one? You know, that is high living compared to what these things were. I mean, this was a, basically a shack with a disgusting bed that when you looked at it, it would move because there was, so, there was like a whole ecosystem going on in there. And it was dark and damp and moldy and whatever. And this was where you would stay overnight. So it was, you know, not great accommodation, but the guy got to rest and recover and heal, right, for like almost a month if, uh, if our history is, is guiding us correctly on that one. And so this guy shows seven, and I think I might have just found an eighth, uh, uh, extension of kindness towards somebody that he's supposed to hate, right? Samaritans aren't supposed to do this. His buddies probably would have been like, yo, what, what are you doing, man? That guy, I don't know if you know this, super Jewish, right? <laughs> You're super not. Don't do stuff like that. Imagine, guys, a year after 9-11, all right? We, we had all sorts of religious and racial tension with m folks from the Middle East, and we didn't understand Islam. We didn't understand what clerics do and all this kind of stuff, and, and people were scared and tensions were running high. Imagine you're on the side of the road with a broken leg and a Muslim cleric comes over to help you. Back then, a lot of people would have wondered, what are his intentions, right? That's the level of, of uncertainty that would have been going on in this relationship. And then he gets picked up, gets put on a donkey, and somebody that he disagrees with theologically winds up saving his life in, in this physical life that we now occupy. By the way, the Samaritan, also, Jesus also would have disagreed with him, right? Jesus does not affirm his theology. He doesn't say he's right about the things of God. But what he says is, sometimes the unbelievers are better examples than the believers of God's value system. Doesn't make their beliefs true. But man, when you've got to take a rebuke from an outsider... You know you're off track, right? I hear this all the time about some of the cults that we, you know, interact with and share the gospel with locally. Yeah, but they're great with family. I'm like, yeah, I know. But they stole that from us. They're just doing it better than we are. Maybe that's not a testament so much to the truth of that belief system. Maybe it's just a testament to the fact that maybe we ought to pay a little more attention to our actions, you know? And so that's what Jesus is saying here. So he says, I mean, the point of this is very simple, right? Be like that guy. On a practical level, day-to-day, -day, be like that guy. So let's, let's pull the camera back for a second. The, the lawyer says, all right, I get it. Love God with everything you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. But really, who's my neighbor? Right? And he, he's like, let's, let's, get, you know, let's get legalistic about this. So he, goes, he puts on his lawyer hat, and he starts parsing words. He starts redefining some stuff. He's like, now, when you say neighbor, you really mean, because the, the, the Jewish uh, teaching at that time was that your neighbor is only the people inside of Israel, inside of your ethnic group, which kind of makes sense. I mean, they had been so oppressed. They had been so beaten up. They had been murdered and slaughtered and captived. And you know, that's not a word, but it is now. It's on recording. And uh, they, they had been, uh, th their nation had been passed around like a political baseball card. And everybody's taxing them and everybody's beating them all the time. And so what, what happens under persecution is you pull back and you protect the core, right? So everything was in, inwardly focused. We take care of each other. And so the way that they would interpret this Old Testament law from Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself, they would say, yeah, and these are my neighbors. Those guys, those are my enemies. And so they said, God only meant this for us to love our racial brothers and sisters as ourselves. Then Jesus shows up in Matthew 5, 43, and he just shreds these guys. He's like, all right, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your neighbor and your enemy. If somebody punches you in the face, you turn your other cheek. What? What is he talking about? 
You see, Jesus' point there is, if you get to redefine the law of God, it sucks the power out of it. It takes all the teeth out of it. If he says, love your neighbor, and you get to decide who that is, then you only have to obey the law when you feel like it. Pastor Greg taught me this about marriage. He said, if both of you always agree all the time, one of you is unnecessary, right? It's like that between us and God, too. If, we, if his law only applies when we agree with it, then we are actually the lawgiver in that situation. He's not. And so Jesus says, you need to listen to what God said here. Love your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? My neighbors are only the people around me, right? Well, from whose perspective? I mean, from here, you know, Corey looks like he's a long ways away to me by some metrics. But what if you held the whole world in your hand and all seven point whatever billion people in the world are on this tiny little dot? We would all look like we're in pretty close proximity to each other, wouldn't we? Who can you look at in that scenario and say, that guy's not my neighbor? God would be like, what do you mean? He's right there next to you. You occupy the same chunk of dirt. Now, we can look at each other and say, you know, that guy's not my brother or my sister in the faith. There are divisions to make. Jesus separates people into sheep and goats, right? The redeemed world and the lost world and all of this. But then from another perspective, all the human race bears the image of God. And he created each and every person on time and on purpose. And so for us to draw value distinctions, he takes that off the table. He says, that's not your job. So who's your neighbor? Well, the lawyer's like, I think it's a pretty small group. And Jesus says, well, let me prove you wrong with your own words. He says, who here was doing some neighboring? And you know, it's funny actually, in verse 37, the lawyer, he can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. Look at this. He said, he was answering Jesus' question, hey, who was a neighbor to him? He said, the one who showed mercy to him. He's like, hey, who was a neighbor? The, 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 oh, no, he got me. The, the, the nice guy. I can picture Jesus being like, just say it, Samarit, Samaritan. You just say it? You just say it? Couldn't do it, right? I don't know if Jesus actually did that. That's not in the Bible. I'm just filling in the gaps here. <laughs> so when, when the lawyer then tries to play word games, Jesus says, all right, I can do that. If you want to play word games, you, you want to redefine who is my neighbor, how about this? How about you stop looking at neighbors as a noun, a person who occupies a certain place, and you start looking at neighboring as a verb? In other words, you want to know who is your neighbor? Whose neighbor are you going to be today? Right? Maybe the responsibility isn't on their end to have an address closer to you. Maybe the responsibility is on your end to go and approach them and see what they need. Cross the metaphorical street, right? So who's your neighbor? Anybody that you come into contact with that has a need. Or maybe they've always been your neighbor and you just discover them at that point. That's Jesus' point here, right? So like, don't shrink the scope of your responsibility. You want to see the world the way that God does, which is that all people, while distinct individuals that matter, in, in and of themselves, we are also an interconnected group in some ways. And if I have resources that I am able to share with you and I don't do it, that's a sin, right? There's a proverb that says that. It says, do not pay tomorrow what you have in your hand to pay today. There's a reason for that. Somebody needs that, right? So there was this, uh, this guy that wrote a book I was, I was reading about, actually about this, uh, this subject, and he said that he was on a missions committee, Right? This is why I don't like committees, by the way. You, after this story, you'll find out. He was on a missions committee at his church. This is back in the 90s. And they wanted to send some money away to famine relief. Right? And he said, hey, the worst famine in the world is happening in North Korea right now. Let's send some money to famine relief in North Korea. And the missions committee said, no, they are our military enemies. And he was like, excuse me? They're starving children over here, and we're not going to help them because our president and their president don't get along? Are you nuts? Have you read Luke 10? And they were like, nope, not those guys. Sounded like Jonah, right? Not those guys. We're not going to save those guys. I'll go to the people I like. The father of modern missions, a guy named William Carey. He went to Sarampur, India, and um, basically blazed the trail for how we do global mission work these days. Um, this is back in the uh, long time ago, late 1700s, early 1800s, I forget exactly. He... Um, he goes over because somebody told him not to, right? What happened was he went to, guess what, a missions committee at his church, and he said, nobody's in India. We got to go to India. And they told him, and I quote, sit down, young man. If the Lord endeavors to save those people, he does not need your help. Let me tell you what you don't do to a young guy that understands the Great Commission. You don't tell him to sit down and shut up. 
What you do is you equip him and cut him loose. Because God's doing something in him in such a way that he sees the world like Jesus does, not like the natural man does. And so, just seeing, a, just grabbing a, a glimpse, just a hint of what Jesus was talking about in, in, the, the great, in, in the Good Samaritan has launched the gospel all over the world and relief efforts and famine relief and, and water projects and education and human rights and all sorts of stuff that follows on, the, on the, the tail of Christian missions. Why? Because somebody said, hey, sit down and shut up. And he's like, I got a better idea. How about we act like Jesus? You see the power of this? Right? And then when we don't, when we play defense instead, when we accumulate, then we suck all of that power out of the world into ourselves, and it turns out we don't really usually do much with it anyway. What Jesus was doing here was releasing us to be a blessing to the world in the name of Christ. And the crazy thing is, guys, it works, right? The ripple effects of this are enormous. How many of you guys, don't raise your hands, how many of you guys were given a leg up in life, just given a shot when you were down in the gutter, you had nothing, and somebody crossed the street, saw you, took you in, cared for you, and now you look back and you said, boy, without that person, I would not be where I am in life, right? How many of us have that story? A lot. You know, some of you guys have been on both sides of that story. You've been the person that got help, and now you're the person helping other people. I can look around this room and think, just thinking about who was in last service and everything, there's at least five families that are coming to mind right now that are, are or recently have housed people that just needed some help. In fact, a couple of families got multiple people living in them, uh, living in their, their homes that just need a shot, you know? And, so, and these people... Get on their feet, they go out, and then they turn around, and in the rearview mirror, they see so much blessing that they have brought out into the world, trace right back to the home of a good Samaritan somewhere. What Jesus says here is incredibly powerful, and it shaped our culture. So, anytime Jesus tells a story, anytime anybody really tells a moral tale, what's happening there is, is they're saying, all right, look at the characters here and see who you align with. So, let's take a quick inventory here, right? How often have we been the priest and the Levite? Okay. Now, I'm not here to beat you up. I get it. None of us have lived up to this perfectly. We've all been the priest and the Levite at times. You know? But could we just like, identify that and say, hey, maybe we should move away from that. Right? Like, maybe we just, point, just, just put our finger on it and say, I don't want to do that anymore. There's this thing that happens in the Christian life where like, you, you become like the people you hang out with the most. Right? So as you spend more time with God, as you spend more time in prayer and reading the Bible, you start to see things a little bit more his way. And there's this shift that happens, and I've heard it described by a lot of people in different terms. But essentially what happens is, at the beginning of your Christian life, you think, gosh, I gotta, I gotta give that? He really wants me to sacrifice that? And then somewhere down the road, you realize that you're not thinking that way so much anymore. Usually you're thinking, I wish I had more to help with. The need is so big, and my pool of resources is so small. You know, what can I... Have you guys ever driven down the road, and, and don't, don't tell me, just, just for yourself, have you guys ever driven down the road and just looked at the faces of the people that are driving in the cars the other direction and just thought, like, man, every single one of those people has a story, every one of them has a hurt or a pain either in their past or that they're going through right now, every one of these people has a fear, something they're afraid of, and then you just, like, I mean, there's, there's this crushing weight to it, just like, I, I can't fix all of that. I can't do enough. I mean, Jesus said it, right? The, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. God, what do you want me to do? If you've never had that experience where you're awake at night, just pacing back and forth when you should be sleeping because there's people in the world that are hungry and naked and cold and abused, and you just can't get there. You don't have the means to get there. You guys, that hurts. But that's when you're starting to see the world the way that God does, right? That's when you're not passing by on the other side of the road and being like, oh, man, yeah, it sucks to be that guy. I got stuff to do. Let me scroll through Twitter a little more, you know? He, he changes our perspective. And it's a beautiful thing to see because he comes in with this promise. Jesus does it. He says, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you, Right? So you're like, all right, Lord, I see the problem. I'm seeing a little tiny sliver of what you're seeing here. Just send me in to go fix it. Give me the power. Give me the resources. Give me something to go and help. And he says, prayers like that get a yes. Now, the yes will come from surprising places, but you guys will be shocked if you have never called out to the Lord and said, let me solve some people's problems. How he shows up and lets you help. 
The stories are incredible. I love them. One of the greatest things about this job is that I get a lot of these stories. People call me and say, Pastor, guess what just happened? And I'm like, tell me about it. And I just get to collect these things, man. I got this big old mental treasure chest of just ways that God has shown up and helped people in what seemed like hopeless situations. And for us, in the body of Christ, it's normal. Happens all the time. Why? Because God meant what he said. Right? Jesus said, you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. You don't always know how it's going to show up, but watch him use you when you start to commit to be the good Samaritan. So, we have been the priest and the Levite. We ought to desire to be the good Samaritan. God moves us there over time. We ask him to accelerate that progress. I just want to point out one thing. Don't shy away from being the, the beat up and bloody guy. Okay? When you are hurting, you automatically become like the most precious person in the church. Right? When you're hurting and people find out about it, they just swarm you like, hey, let me pray for you. Let me pray with you. How can I help? How can I give you this? Come, let's, let's go get some lunch. And what happens is that God is so much in favor of all of these good works that happen in the Good Samaritan type of space that when somebody's hurting, it allows for so much of that to go on. That all glorifies God, right? People get to serve you when you're hurting. And in doing that, they find out the reason for which they were born right? Like they, something comes alive inside of them and you got to take the hit. You got to absorb that for a while. And what God's asking you to do is, he says, essentially roll with me on this. This is going to hurt, but a whole lot of wonderful stuff is going to happen around you. Okay. And so as Christians, we say, okay, it's time for me to be the beat up and bloodied guy. We don't enjoy it. We ask to be done with it as soon as God would allow, but it serves a function as well. Right? So just don't, don't shy away from that. That's all I'm saying. If you need an example of the Good Samaritan. You'll find good little examples here and there. But, and, and I kid you not, guys, I don't just say this because this is what preachers are supposed to say. You will not find a better example of this than Jesus. Right? Think about this. Just for a second. Go, go down with me on this comparison. So we are in a helpless situation before God, separated from God by our sin. I cannot rewind the clock and undo all of my sin. I can't do it. And if I could do it, I would go back, give it another shot, probably screw it up worse next time than I did last time. Right? I don't have it in my power to fix my sin problem. And so Jesus then sees us and crosses the road, so to speak. He took on human flesh and he took on our problem. He comes to us and he binds us up. He heals us. How many of you in here have been healed physically by Jesus? How many of you in here have been healed spiritually by Jesus? How many of you in here have had your relationships and your emotions? There's a little kid waving at me. Yes! Um, <laughs> and relationships healed by Jesus. This is what he does. When he says he binds up the brokenhearted, he ain't playing, people. So when we look at him, we say, ah, that's what it looks like, right? And all of this stuff about keeping the law to a certain degree and whatever, it just starts to be like, man, not only is that hopeless, but what God actually offers is so much better. He doesn't just offer us a law. He offers us himself. And when we take that, we're given life, eternal life, because again, He's the source of all life. All right, so a couple of ideas. You know, how are you going to put this into practice this week? I don't know. It's going to look different for every one of you, but let me just throw some ideas out there, all right? First off, keep a couple hundred bucks in your, uh, in your, your wallet, your glove box, your purse, whatever, because you're going to come across needs. You'd be shocked at the needs that you can meet with just a couple hundred bucks. One of our guys was down at Les Schwab a few months ago, and this gal, you know, was in a tough spot. Didn't, she needed a tire, didn't have any money. He got to just go ahead and help out, right? Be ready for stuff like that. Dude, okay, so my pastor told me to do this one time, a long time ago. So I'm in the drive-thru at Jack in the Box, right? <laughs> Taking care of the temple, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I see in my rearview mirror the guy behind me, and he's, he's, wearing, uh, he's wearing army fatigue. He's military get-up. And so I told the guy at Jack in the Box, like, oh, I'm going to obey my pastor. Hey, I, I want to pay for his meal, too, trying to be the good Samaritan. They said, all right. So there goes 11 bucks, pay for that guy's meal. And they said, hey, the fries aren't ready. Can you pull off over there and wait? I said, sure, we'll wait for fries. That's my motto in life. So I, uh, I pull off over here. Well, his fries weren't ready either, so he pulls up next to me, right? And he rolls down his window, and I roll down my window, and I'm like, oh, no, he's going to thank me. And he goes, hey, man, thanks. I really appreciate that. And I was like, hey, dude, thanks for what you do. I appreciate that. And he goes, what do you mean? And I look at him, and I realize he got all of that stuff from a secondhand store, like a military surplus. He wasn't in the Army. And I'm like, yo, dude, I want my $11 back. <laughs> But, you know, we had a great conversation and so on. So, look, the point is, you will get burned. It's okay, right? You don't have to be a genius to do this. Just go serve somebody. Keep a couple hundred bucks around. Keep some, some water and some protein bars in your car, all right? 
People get into bad situations. They're on a wreck on the side of the road. They got diabetes issues, whatever. I mean, I don't know, but sometimes, I mean, I'm amazed at how often when I have it, people need it, right? So just be ready to meet a couple of these needs. Here's one. On the 4th of July, we have no church functions. It's two weeks from today. We don't have a basics of Christian living class at night. We don't have a barbecue at night. Go be with your neighbors, right? We're having a block party at our place. We're going we're gonna to shut it down. We're going to line up grills across the street. Kids will play in all the yards, whatever. Just go swap some phone numbers. And I promise you guys this. If you get people talking enough, they will tell you their needs, right? You ask enough questions, get them talking, you'll figure out what they need in life. Maybe you get to meet a couple of those. So go be a neighbor to your neighbors, right? Fourth of July. Right now in the, in the youth um, class back there where uh, Mike is discipling your kids, what he's doing, somebody came to the church and just handed me some cash, which I don't normally like because, you know, the whole pastors and money and transparency thing. So I'm like, ah, just put it in the boxes. But this time we did something different with it. Um, we, we broke it up into small increments and we said, hey, let's take this amount and we'll give it out to the youth and tell them, go bless somebody and bring some glory to God. See if you can get a chance to share the gospel with somebody and then come back in a month and report on how it went. Right? We also wrote up letters for the parents. So if you've got kids back there right now, then you're on to them. All right? Got your back on that. Like, hey, your kids have some money, by the way. Because, uh, you know, the temptation is like, shh. Right? So anyway, so we're gonna, we just put a little bit of money in their hands. It might be 20, 30 bucks a person, right? But we're gonna, we just want them to practice. Like, go be a blessing. So there's all sorts of stuff you can do. Right? Get creative. Have some fun. Try something. There's no rules here. Just go and bless somebody. See what happens. Like, why not, right? What's the worst thing that could happen? You get ripped off a little bit? That's all right. It's going to happen. I mean, someday you're going to die and go to heaven. You won't miss whatever it is you lost anyway. Don't worry about it. So, okay, guys. Go and be a blessing to somebody. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to come back and see what it was that this lawyer was missing and what Jesus was teaching us through this exchange about eternal life. Okay? Today was more about love your neighbor. Next week, we're going to talk more about loving God. And that is, you know, that has ripple effects in our lives as well. The two end up amplifying each other. So I hope you're here for that. All right, let me pray for us. God, again, this is the kind of thing that we don't know how to obey unless you teach us, right? Because the, the human heart is deceptively wicked and deceitful above all else, and who can know it? Like, we, we've read this stuff. We, we know. But we've also read where you say our hearts are going to go if left to their own devices. And it's always going to go towards greed. It's always going to go towards accumulation. And even if we've been conditioned by our culture or our fathers who raised us well or, you know, or something like that, that, um, you know, that generosity is a good thing, we're still going to be fighting against our own nature to get that done at times. And so I'm just asking that you would change our nature. Give us a new nature. Cause us each. I mean, you've, you have caused us to be born again, right? But there's like... You could have taken us to heaven immediately after you saved us, but you didn't. You left us here. And I think that's because you want us to do good works while we're here. And so empower us to do those things so that we can meet needs, be kind to people. It's like, like my kids always pray at the, at the, the dinner table, right? Like, and for those that don't have enough to eat, send us in to solve the problem. You know? Teach us to do that. Because I think that brings glory to you that makes you happy, and there's a lot of need out there. So cause us to be the solution if you would be so kind. Pray this in Jesus' name and under his blood. But let me send you out with this. Jesus often, when he's talking about ethical <laughs> commands in the world, he ends with something like this, like he says here. Go and do likewise. So everything that he said today, right? Go bless your neighbor. Love God with everything you got. Do all of that stuff. He tells it to the lawyer, and he says to you, go and do likewise. Let me know if we can help. We would love to. Thanks for being here.